Hey everyone, welcome to the session. In this session, we are going to talk about key lessons learned from building a wealth management portal using cloud native architecture. I am Ankur Kumar. I'm a senior director of technology. And so before we get into the session details, let me give you a brief intro about myself. Uh, I've been with Sapien for more than 10 years with industry for 22 plus years. I am the technology lead for financial services. Hey everyone, welcome to the session. In this session, we are going to talk about key lessons learned from building a wealth management portal using cloud native architecture. I am Ankur Kumar. I'm a senior director of technology. And so before we get into the session details, let me give you a brief intro about myself. Uh, I've been with Sapien for more than 10 years with industry for 22 plus years. I am the technology lead for financial services I focus on microservices and cloud native architecture. I'm certified as MuleSoft uh, platform architect, TOGAF enterprise architect, um, AWS solution architecture, and also I've done safe and scale agile certification. Um, mm -hmm. I've been uh, speaking at uh, different conferences. Um, so feel free to engage me at Twitter or LinkedIn to know more. And I'm very excited to talk about today's session where we are going to see what I have learned and as part of um, a journey which we started a few years back of building a wealth management portal uh, for a client in North America. So before we dive deep into wealth management uh, case study, let's understand what a wealth management is. If you are already in financial services sector, you might be knowing this, but for those who do not are part of financial services, it's an advisory business where you do advise your clients or how to make your investment, how to grow money, how to make sure uh, you manage the cash and um, investment strategy for your clients. So as part of that, there are two key uh, entities. And the first part is advisor who is uh, advising the clients and uh, who are basically involved in making that investment strategy and making the investment on behalf of the clients. Advisors are essentially uh, are regulated by FINRA or SEC. Uh, they in fact get a unique ID from them and they uh, have to register and go through that process. Once you are done that, once you identify a client or you can say a prospect even before the client, uh, you start discussing the initial goals and objectives and build that relationship with the client. And then you start doing the financial planning process as part of the wealth management goal. Uh, once you understand what is the long-term or short-term goal for a particular client, and then you start capturing different information for the client. You start collaboratively working with the client to understand and create a financial plan, and then mutually open, um, uh, mutually open up that uh, strategy of how you are going to make money for them. And, um, there are different aspects of, uh, I'm, I'm, I can't capture all different aspects, but this is just a quick summary of what an advisor does for a client, uh, opening up the digital account, managing the investment portfolio, rebalancing as per the market dynamics. These are some of the examples, but it's, it's a symbiotic relationship between the client uh, or we could say advisor and the client. So from the client perspective, what they're expecting from advisor is that um, once they understand their financial objective, basically help them grow the money, uh, provide the details of how they are doing it. Uh, they have to definitely work 
and trust the advisor because they are sharing all this information like bank accounts or, or all the financial details so that they can plan for their financial future. Um, exchange the documents and um, they are giving the, an authority to advisor to manage the financial plan. So you pay for advisory fees uh, as part of your assets under management, but um, it's advisor and client, they are working um, closely to make sure that the money or the investment strategy is in, is in uh, place for that. So in order to do that, and that's where the wealth management portal or wealth management business comes into the picture. And that's what we are going to talk about today is how a technology can help an advisor to serve their clients better. And, and that's a statement from an advisor we captured early on is they don't want to worry about the platform. They want to worry about the client. So they, uh, platform is just a tool. Um, the main purpose is to serve their clients. So when we started in, in the, the journey, which I'm going to share for one of the clients and um, uh, where it's the second largest um, wealth management, uh, you can say a broker dealer company. I can't share the name because of the confidentiality. But when we started working with them, um, you know, first thing you understand, try to understand from advisors and from the client is what is the uh, key business challenge and um, the drivers where, you know, we wanted to enable the advisors. We wanted to launch new features quickly. We wanted to ensure that advisors are getting the kind of service they are expecting so that they can serve their clients better. And in order to do that, they wanted to ensure that they have the right operational um, efficiency. Uh, the platform can be scalable and extensible as the market changes. They should be able to uh, meet the needs for the client. So time to market and uh, the ease of integration with different vendors is also a key part. And the most essential part of the experience, experience of advisor, experience of the client so that they can serve their clients and clients can experience um, um, an integrated experience so that they can see the financial plan. They can ensure that they can, they have easy access to all the information. So in order to do that, they, they ensure that, you know, the outcome is that how do I reduce the total cost of ownership, um, reduce the time to market, um, do better brand positioning, and, and also increase your advisor and client support base. With that business challenge in mind, we started our journey towards um, almost in 2018 timeframe, we started building this digital platform. Um, and um, there were three key goals as outlined here. One is technology that you can ensure that technology is an enabler. And um, we want to do, have the latest and greatest technology, but not using the microservices architecture and all that, but that's not the essence of it. Essence is that uh, you want to create an integrated customer experience, an end-to-end -end digital experience, and so that the advisor can bring that bigger financial picture to the client. And, and they need certain tools like digital vaults, um, you know, easy, e-sign, and different capabilities. You will see uh, that how do I accelerate the experience which I'm giving to the clients. So the accelerated delivery is one thing which uh, was always key that how can I do uh, monthly releases or even weekly releases as, as what we need uh, of the hour. Earlier, they used to have like six month release cycle. So we wanted to ensure that we can meet all these, um, you know, kind of a delivery goals as well as experience goal and technologies uh, enabler to doing that. So um, I, I like this quote where uh, we say that, you know, do the best you can uh, to, you know, the better because you, there are so many unknowns, right? So the idea is how do we start progressing? And as we know better, we will try to do better. That's the intent of it. So in that journey or any journey to be, um, any journey, my focus is always in, and that's what I also suggest others to do is that look at the lens from people, process, and technology um, uh, perspective. So when you look from these lenses that how do I, it always starts with strategy and consulting, right? But the, 
the dynamics are when, when I say people is customer experience or advisor or client experience enabled by technology and, and the product is at the intersection of it when we are talking about all three dimensions. So product is the output, but you know, all this uh, is all about these three different dimensions perspective. So moving forward, I think what we started doing is that we started streamlining, streamlining the advisor and client experience and we can't do it in a day. So we defined a roadmap uh, that, okay, let's, let's do that with uh, building the platform slash foundation. Then we start launching the MVP feature. Um, let's say the, the client portal and advisor portal and financial planning and some of the capabilities we are talking about, which are essentials for uh, advisor and client to do business. And then later on, we start uh, 2019, we started streamlining and accelerating some of the capabilities that how do I integrate with some of the key capabilities like account opening, electronic delivery, CRM integration and all that. So he took a, a crawl, walk and run approach that, you know, how you can start defining the baseline first, and then you start launching capabilities on top of it. So by 2020, the platform was fully operational and now uh, it's kind of being used by 20,000 plus advisors. So having said that, uh, the first lesson, which as part of the journey, uh, which, I, which, which we learned as a group is that organization culture. And I know it's, it sounds, uh, you know, that organization culture, okay, that's fine, but what do I mean? And is we, we observe that, you know, engineering is a lot driven by when you say what an organization culture is allowing you to offer. Um, and having said that some organizations, they are very waterfallish in nature and some organizations they are, they want to, they are very agile in nature. So what we started observing is that how we get that support. And the first thing, like I said, that uh, for us, it was to ensure that, and going back to Conway's law is that, you know, organization, whatever is your organization, you will start designing your architecture as per your organization. So, so putting, and I can correlate with that because that's what we observed that, you know, um, the key challenge, which we saw that any, any such organization where you go and start driving the digital platform ad adoption, uh, initially you need to understand the culture of the organization and, and, and ensure that you get enough support from the executive um, and, and change, or at least try to change the culture of the organization so that you can build that platform. So that's what our initial uh, learning was that, how do I change the culture of the organization and, uh, leadership support, um, you know, the, make sure that, you know, the key stakeholders, you get a buy-in from them and they understand the why part, why we are doing this. And, um, and, and also people have this fear of, you know, what will happen to the existing platform. So you need to build that psychological safety um, and, and bring the culture of and cultivate the culture of product mindset, not uh, the, just that we are doing this project now. No, we are, and that's what, uh, you know, Martin Fowler's, if you have read the article a long time ago, he published, you know, that we need to move from the siloed functional teams to, um, you know, more of a, uh, a pod based, uh, you know, teams, right. That where you have a, a vertical cut of, uh, you know, people where they're business driven, not that, you know, there is a UI specialist, there is a middleware specialist, a DBA specialist. So, so cultivating that product mindset is important and it's not, it will not happen in a day in our experience. Also, it didn't happen, but gradually you start, um, doing that in first sprint, second sprint, and, and you'll start seeing that, you know, after a few sprints of development and following that approach and consistently doing it, you'll see that that will start, everybody will start adopting to it. So you need to uh, promote that culture and ensure that, you know, that you, um, also promote the culture of you build it, you run it kind of culture. And that's what, after our first release, we wanted the dev team to start operationalizing it as well. So, um, that, that's another thing, which culturally you have to enforce. One thing, um, which I 
strongly believe is you know every failure is a learning opportunity and i've seen this uh, there will be lots of failures during and we also encountered that but every failure we need to ensure that we are not uh, pushing the team rather than we are enabling the team okay it's it's a learning opportunity and ensure that you know the team is focused on meeting the end objective all right so the second part um of our um, the second part is um, after the, this transformation journey the lesson learned is that how do we um establish and people ask me that is there any um secret sauce to it and i always say that you know it's every organization journey and you know, every engineering transformation is unique and it's contextual to what organization or what client we are working on or what uh is the program under cons um consideration right so we kind of uh, start looking at it uh, from holistic perspective that engineering and cloud transformation when you start looking at you know from the technology and engineering from product process from communication culture there are different aspects to it so if you look at it like technology engineering you ensure that you know you are following cloud devops and you know microservices kind of architecture which is the modern day architecture and then you ensure that from product perspective you have the right ways of working you have the product management um, team in place you are focusing on customer experience and all and then you have uh, the right communication and and influence on the culture so that you enable that culture to build that capability and then from organization de design perspective you ensure that you know product and customer are aligned there is enough governance in place and there are our right matrix to be better so this is just a framework but you need to customize in all these areas that what works for you and that's what we did uh, so we got this framework from sapient um kind of ways of working we kind of use this framework as a reference but um we customize it as per this journey as well so uh, that's that's something which is up to you that how you want to customize it the third lesson which i learned as part of that journey is that how do you innovate and how do you apply open source and cloud native and these are very powerful technology which you have under uh, consideration right that uh, because it it gives you the empowerment and enabler to build something bigger so when we started uh, defining the architecture and and this is a very simpler simplistic view of uh, the architecture and the logical architecture which um i can't share the details but this is a you can say a 50000 feet view of the uh, the logical architecture that we had the user experience layer for advisor portal and the client portal and then we had this uh, api orchestration layer you can see experience there which is aggregating the experience for um for the front end here you can say back and for front end pattern um and then you have the microservices layer beneath that which is uh, using caching messaging and other different uh, features but essentially these microservices are being orchestrated uh, by the upper layer and then uh, you know services are being rendered to the front end layer and then then at the end you have the system of record you have many databases we had and you have uh, you know different third party integration system data warehouse system and other analytics and third party systems but i'm not getting into details of but at the high level these are the different layers of the architecture which we design and uh, powered by the you know different cross cutting concerns that we have to address so when we start laying down this foundational architecture we started seeing that okay what are the different elements of the architecture which we can meet with open source and as an engineering principal we were always keen to look into what are the capabilities open source or the cloud native can offer um so the application architecture uh we started with um, a reference architecture for application but we started looking for what are the different capabilities then application architecture needs to have right so so we started with the before actually choosing the technology ch choice we started looking at what are the um what are the capabilities we are looking for so 
definitely we need it for uh, a better self-service and application development experience. We wanted, um, you know, the Kubernetes uh, kind of management and administrative interface. Um, we wanted observability so that we know what's happening beneath, behind the scene. We wanted uh, better release management so we can do the faster build and release deployment and better time to market. We wanted to understand the analytics and notification and apply that. A CI, CD, and all configuration management is part of that, you know, um, continuous delivery um, approach. Um, and, and, and then we wanted uh, to enable that the whole um, support for CSED, we wanted a container registry, software supply chain, secrets management on all these um, different set of capabilities which you typically have uh, as part of your uh, software delivery. Um, and the foundational layer is, you know, there is a, a container runtime and orchestration engine um, power, um, and, and then compute network and storage. So these are the logical you can say capabilities we wanted in in the application, uh, you know, cloud native kind of a reference architecture. So once we knew that you know this is what we were looking for, we started now mapping out that okay, what do I need to do? And I'm not going to share details about all the application architecture, but uh, this is a map of what we chose, right? So we used to, uh, for application, okay. We chose Angular, Spring Boot, Drupal, Elastic, Redis, and Postgres as technology empowering different microservices and, and different components of the architecture. But uh, the key part is that uh, for Kubernetes, we um, were in fact, uh, they were already using Rancher. So we, um, we kept using Rancher as a, as a more like a Kubernetes managed interface. Um, which was providing a nice dashboard and, uh, you know, kind of a capability to monitor your uh, container orchestration and all. And uh, we already had the good relationship with New Relic and New Relic was already in, in that organization. So we use that as an observability and um, you can see application performance monitoring solution. But if you look at this, you know, we, we kind of leveraged a lot of open source technology for CI CD like Jenkins and, um, you know, Kubernetes uh, as, as an underlying platform and Bitbucket and all. And then we started, we also um, looked at like JFrog Artifactory and used that as a registry and uh, for software supply chain also JFrog and secrets and identity management. Um, earlier it was Centrify, but uh, it got acquired by CyberArk. So we are uh, we're using that as an identity management solution. And uh, Docker was definitely the, uh, the runtime engine. And um, initially we were into Rancher cattle, which is not, um, you can say at that time Kubernetes compliant, but now we are moving towards the Kubernetes um, kind of orchestration. Um, so, and also in parallel, because this whole uh, architecture we had, you know, the complexity of the architecture is a hybrid cloud kind of architecture. So uh, some services and some components are on-prem. Now we have also started taking another initiative where we are moving some of the components of the AWS. So there are already, um, those components are using EKS and uh, Lambda um, as, as, as a function, as a service, and some of the, you know, the AWS native services. Um, so it's, it's a hybrid cloud kind of, you can say architecture where use, we are using on-prem cluster using Rancher, uh, as an orchestration, um, managing all the containers and for cloud side, we are using AWS EKS. So it's a mixed, uh, you know, kind of an architecture where we are using hybrid cloud. So, but if you look at the technology options here, we ensure that we not only see that what is aligned to that organization, as well as what is. Uh, better suited in that context. So, you know, your answer could be different. Uh, it's, I always believe that it depends a lot on the context and the organization, which technology you choose, but you know, that's what we also did. And, uh, uh, and you can use the same mechanism to do that in your architecture. So having said that, um, the next thing, which, uh, is core to my heart is about the deployment, right? Because if you notice in the early, you know, kind of a vision, which when we started talking about what we were looking for the architecture and what we were looking for is that 
uh, time to market, right? So if you can't do the deployment right and do it something in a um, in a time friendly fashion, that you won't be able to achieve that uh, vision, right? So um, the lesson learned is that you know we also learned it hard way that in any architecture, including cloud native architecture, you need to manage the deployment considerations early on. And when I say manage, um, you don't need to wait, you know, till the whole, because in early days, you are focused more on development. So you're kind of, uh, don't ignore the deployment aspects of it, because that is where uh, we'll bring a lot of efficiency for the future releases. So when we started looking at, you know, the cloud native um, architecture which we established um, and um, you know you might get overwhelmed with so many technology or uh, so many components you can say which you have in your um, uh, application right so um, and every component can have a different deployment approach like we chose MuleSoft as a um, API management solution so that has a different way of deploying uh, than a microservices application which are you know, like Spring Boot application has different way of deployment. So uh, similarly, if you have like RabbitMQ, for example, we used for messaging, um, how do you ensure that the infrastructure as a code is set up um, and then you set up RabbitMQ on your production server? So every component has to be considered uh, from the overall deployment perspective and that's the essence of it that's what i'm trying to communicate here is that once you understand your the application dynamics you need to ensure that you have the details of each component that how you are going to manage the deployment of that aspect and that's what we also did um so based on that you know kubernetes is foundational uh, and we all know that you know when you are discussing a kubernetes as a strategy uh, one of the lessons learned is that you need to be very early on discussing all these strategy and we learned at hardware again that um, you start with like rancher cattle and now we are moving to full-blown kubernetes that it's it's a painful journey if you're doing that so think about the kubernetes journey early on that what part of and when you say kubernetes there are some parts nowadays you are having serverless you are having like we are talking we have also deployed in aws fargate so you need to think about what components you want to deploy to serverless what fits better for that area and what component you want to keep it to um, you know your managed kubernetes and what you want to uh, still do a self-managed engine like rancher cattle so i think that is where a lot of innovation and uh, you have many options uh, but you need to be very clear in terms of establish so the key lesson is that you know establish that strategy first and and for each component that strategy can be different okay um the fifth, uh, and the, that's one of the most important areas, is that when you are building a complex solution like a wealth management, um, you can't build every capability by your own. Uh, why? Because the time to market is a pressure. You need to launch, like we launched in nine months, so we we need to ensure that you launch that capability sooner and and then get the early feedback. So integration, why integrations? Um, what we learned is it's it's a it's a big accelerator, and um, um, you can keep the patterns to what industry standards are. But some of the capabilities, for example, uh, financial planning, you, we used Money Guide Pro, and and that's a um, that's a vendor providing financial planning, some of the areas of financial planning. But um, we we also integrate with some vendors like Yodli for account aggregation so why we are doing that why not building that capability yourself because if you start doing for every capability you need to decide that whether you want to do build or buy but if you don't want to do buy then it's the time to market will increase so that balance we need to keep and that's why integration plays a key role in any such solution like wealth management uh, some of the capabilities you're not going to build from scratch you are going to take uh, vendor offered capabilities and you're going to integrate that capability so that you have an integrated experience so the essence is that you know it's an accelerator but you can keep it standardized and we used um, and uh, a great resource is the enterprise integration pattern book which uh, 
has catalog almost 65 patterns, right? Uh, so there are different patterns um, for different areas that what do you want, um, that how you want application to be integrated. And, and all these 65 patterns, uh, you can go and read about in detail, but they offer a great catalog of how you can integrate with external systems. And we leveraged a lot of these patterns when we were kind of integrating with these systems, whether it's pubs up, the point to point, whether it's using dead letter queue for any message which you can't process, whether you're using a messaging bus for communication between services, uh, our, our, our correlation identifier for messaging, uh, a routing we have used a lot of dynamic routing and pipe and filter pattern, uh, message translation, uh, all these patterns we have to apply in different uh, use cases for business. So, and the technology, I'm just outlining some of the technology here. It's not like enlisting all of it, but technology is again, um, an enabler for these patterns. So uh, the key recommendation is that always go and refer to these patterns and see whether you can apply these patterns in, in the, as per your context. And that's what we also learned. And, uh, I'm just sharing a, you know, a view, right. And it's not covering all the vendors. So we've we integrated with like 30 plus vendors. So I can't show you it all, but I'm just sharing that, you know, that when it comes to integration, either you are integrating in a user experience or, or a business process or a data, right. Um, and that's what happens in the typical wealth management uh, context, right. That you are maybe getting accounts data from Yodli. And uh, when I say accounts data, suppose I have a Bank of America account, I'm, I'm just sending a link to my account. So, and wealth management professional need that information. So that data is coming through your lead to your wealth management system. So some integrations are, you know, required like money guide, like I talked about, it requires integration in all three areas, like experience, process, and data. Some are, and, and same goes for account linking and aggregation. We were leveraging you know, all three aspects and some are, you know, you're only like you know, research report, like Morningstar, we, it's a process-based integration where we are getting a PDF or data from Morningstar and then ingesting that data and then and keeping it in our system. And then the experience part is what we own. And uh, similar to that, you know, in that wealth management portal, uh, you always have some custodian like Pershing or Broadridge. So they are providing you the different, um, statements and all. So that is again, in, in my view, it's like, it's a data and process kind of integration. So, so what I'm trying to communicate here is that based on different vendors that, and what capability you want to build and buy, you have to reply to apply different integration patterns. So be, be clear on what you want to apply, what area of integration it is and, and refer to that integration pattern catalog so that you are, you're kind of using this industry standard. And that's what we also did. Um, and, and this is just a sample of what we were talking about, you know, how you are getting data through batch or ETL or a streaming interface. Uh, typically what happens is that some of the integration touch points, you can't even do, uh, you know, the real time integration. Suppose you are getting a, uh, a data, which is too, the volume is too much, right? Because of or some regulatory purpose, you can't do a real-time integration. You have to provide the patch integration interface, interface as well. So this is just a, a view of you, how you can, you know, how we have kind of ingested as well as, um, you know, kind of a built that batch interface as well. But um, again, applying the same set of patterns from the catalog, which we talked about. And that's what the lesson is that, you know, keep, um, all your integration as per, you know, the integration patterns and, and mostly keep it, um, standardized, right? So that's, that's the key essence. Um, the other last point, I just want to make sure you get it from the engineering standpoint is that later on, we realized that it's very important to have a platform engineering team. And in, in initial stage, when we were foundation building the foundation architecture, the platform engineering team is by default, everybody is kind of contributing in that area of building that platform. But late at later stage, that becomes more critical. And that's what we also learned. So we saw that, you know, some of the areas, like if I look at the dev and ops part of it, 
the when we established the platform engineering team, we saw that we gain a lot of momentum um, when we had a focused team. And that's a lesson that if you have not done that, establish a platform engineering team. And uh, these are some of the outcomes which we have seen it happening in dev and op side of it when we did that. Like we redesigned the search experience using Elastic uh, Search and we moved from database to that. And, and a lot of, there was a huge uh, business benefit, like business was looking for a global search kind of um, feature and better response time. We did that with uh, no search redesign. We ensured with faster data ingestion time for better results. We kind of reduced feature toggle and platform engineering team kind of came up with approach uh, how to do feature toggling so that business can switch on and off any feature when we when they need that. We also kind of built a page building experience using Drupal so that you can drag and drop widgets and build a content heavy page. So a lot of these capabilities was the outcome of having that platform engineering team. So um, it's very essential that you also focus on that. And that's the lesson we learned. Um, and for operational team as well, like we, when a production issue comes that we realize soon that we need a consulate observability dashboard. We built that. We also built a dashboard for production support team so that they can, they can quickly resolve an issue. Um, we also started tracking the SRE matrix, the four golden signals. That's what they call it, like latency, traffic and error and resource saturation. So all these traceability or tracking of those metrics through the, you know, the dashboards, uh, instrumentation for distributed tracing, synthetic mo monitoring for proactive alerting. These are just some examples, but platform engineering team made it all possible. So, you know, that ensure that the platform engineering team and helped us to accelerate some of the manual builds to automate it. And, you know, the developer tool enhancement, bringing that high motivation culture and a lot of things happen because of the platform engineering team. That's the key lesson we learned. So all this is just to create the business impact. So I want to highlight um, a quick slide that what impact we created. And I, I just taken a, you know, the advisor's feedback for they sent, you know, once they, in the initial release, once that happened, they experienced the advisor portal um, and they kind of started using it, you know, that, that speaks for itself, that how this type of environment was promoting a good relationship for them to build with uh, their clients. So the key impact we made is that we saw that in, um, after initial releases, we saw that almost 20,000 plus advisors in role. And when I say 20,000 advisors, imagine that each advisor can have many clients. So almost we are talking about five to 10 million clients and then different broker dealers. That's what we call it is that we start seeing a lot of them adopting their platform. We ensure that we move the idea to life from when you, uh, the product manager writes an idea to life. It got reduced from one to three months. We improved automation, sprint lifecycle, and platform ado adoption. And also these are the key impact we made um, as part of the journey. And um, with that, I would just say that, you know, this is just the beginning. We are still um, continuously improving the experience of the platform. And I'll be happy to engage in any conversation on LinkedIn and Twitter. And thanks for spending time to hear me out. Thank you.